In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I've never climbed a mountain just by actually like scaling rock with my bare hands and feet with the ropes and the climbing harnesses and all that stuff. But I have climbed a mountain once with a jeep. Uh, it was a mountain uh, called uh, Mauna Kea in, uh, in Hawaii. And it's the highest that I have ever been by a long yard. So when you start going up the mountain, one of the first things that you observe is the various warning signs. My favorite is the one that says, beware of invisible cows. <laughs> this is pasture land, you see, all around the base of the mountain. And with the fog that rolls in sometimes, you might just suddenly uh, find yourself encountering a cow hidden by the mist. So you have to beware of the invisible cows. You go up and up and up across switchbacks and so on. And then once you get to about uh, 10,000 feet or so, you encounter a visitor center. And there you can buy uh, like little telescopes and you can buy uh, ice cream, you know, the space ice cream, the freeze-dried stuff. And, and you can watch little movies about the history of the mountain. Because you see, this mountain is a very important place if you're interested in astronomy. They've built a bunch of telescopes up there. The various nations of the world each have their own little segment of the mountain. So the Japanese have a telescope. The Americans have more than one telescope. The, uh, the Germans have a telescope, the French, and, and so on. Some of these telescopes are quite large. Uh, the Keck uh, one, which was just the most recent one built, for example, is actually two telescopes that are separated by about 250 yards or so, so that together the computer can match the two images. It's almost like a stereo you know, vision, like with binoculars. The reason they chose this particular mountain was for several reasons. One, it was high. So high that they didn't have to worry about clouds ever obscuring the view. It was far away from any lights, from cities or anything like that. But most intriguingly, it was clean <coughs> air that brought them there. Because you see, the air that comes across that mountain has been going for thousands of miles across the ocean. So it's some of the cleanest air that they could find conveniently on the Earth. Also, it's relatively close to the equator, which is helpful from an astronomy point of view. Anyway, for all these reasons, they built all these telescopes up there, and so they built a visitor center, if you want to go up there, at 10,000 feet. Why 10,000 feet? Because 10,000 feet is the approximate threshold for what is sustainable for human life. Once you go above 10,000 feet, it becomes very difficult for people to survive. Now, there are some peoples around the world who have uh, genetically adapted to high altitudes, like in the Himalayas, for example. But for you and I, 10,000 feet is, is our limit, for the most part. So, if you're going to go above 10,000 feet, they have another sign which basically says no one under the age of 18, pregnant women, people with various heart conditions, and, and all kinds of other conditions they list. It's a quite a large sign. should not go any higher. But if you're brave, you continue. So up you start going. And then one of the first things you notice is all the snow, clean, pure snow that's piled up around you. And then you notice the pickup trucks from all the people who have come up to take some snow so they can take it back down the mountain and build snowmen on the beach in Hawaii. I, I kid you not. I actually stopped at one point and asked one of these people, what are you doing? <laughs> I had in my head that this was some commercial enterprise, like they were going to make snow cones for people or something. But no, no, they just do it for fun. They just do it for fun. So, all right, so we keep going up, up, up. Pretty soon the road starts becoming wintry, like uh, there's ice on the road you have to watch out for, and there's snow plows that have to go through, believe it or not, to clear off the snow. Up, up, up. Then you get so high, there's not even snowfall or ice because you're so far above the clouds and the weather. So you go up, up, up. You start to notice that your car is really struggling uh, to find enough oxygen to, to, to find power. So you have to use a bit more gas as you're going up, up, up. So finally, once you get up to the very top, you're surprised by the fact, first of all, that it is so cold. But secondly, it is so, um, I don't know how to put it, tingly. Like you feel tingly in your body, like on your skin and so on. Because the air is so thin, your body is having a hard time getting oxygen to your cells. So we went up there, and we started to wander around, and we went to one of the telescopes. And we encountered one of the workers there. And we knew we were in trouble because she was wearing an oxygen uh, cannula to, to breathe pure oxygen up there. That's, uh, that's how thin the air is that the people who work up there have to take oxygen. But, you know, you're okay for an hour or two up there, of course. So we uh, walked around some, and we saw that the actual, actual summit of Mauna Kea is not, doesn't have an observatory around top of it. The observatories are kind of in a little bit of a, just a little bit down. So you have to sort of cross a saddle of uh, a ridgeline to get to it. And the wind whipping over that, I don't know how hard it was blowing, but very, very hard and very, very cold. And not surprisingly, we hadn't taken any winter gear with us on this trip to Hawaii. 
So we cross this saddle ridge, and then we start to climb this little path to the very, very tippy top of Mauna Kea, which is at over 12,000 feet. In fact, I think it's 12,626 feet, I think, if I remember right. So you get to the top there, and there's a little geodetic marker that uh, the survey put there with the altitude on it. And there's also, this is what really intrigues me, a little altar. There's a little altar that was placed there by the, the native Hawaiians who celebrate this mountain as being a sacred spot. And one of the issues of this mountain has always been the kind of uncomfortable relationship between the, the Hawaiian people who find this mountain to be sacred and the scientists and others and engineers who want to build their, um, their, their observatories there. But there's a little, little altar there. It's made out of uh, some wood from, you know, that people brought up from some of the native Hawaiian trees. And it's tied together with, with some vines and things. And there's usually some frozen fruit on it, uh, which is an offering to the gods of that, of that mountain. It's intriguing that around the world, every mountain you climb is probably considered sacred to the people who live near it. Mountains have always been associated with the encounter with the divine. And no wonder when you've actually climbed one and you feel the thinness of the air and you, you look around at the barrenness and you know that this is not a place of human habitation. I have to tell you, it gives you the chills when you're actually up there and you sort of feel the starkness of that space. And you really are aware that you are someplace special indeed. Bibles appear, uh, in the Bible, mountains appear continuously, usually at points of transition or, or encounter between God and his people. Um, most famously, perhaps, Mount Sinai, the Old Testament lesson we have today where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, but only after Moses goes through a period of purification for 40 days and 40 nights. The New Testament echoes are there, of course. Jesus, in Matthew's account, makes several kind of echoes to, to Mount Sinai. There's a couple of coded references there most obviously being that Moses himself appears. So Jesus takes his disciples and he goes to the top of this mountain to have a kind of purifying experience maybe or to have some kind of encounter with the divine. And boy, do they have it. The transfiguration. One of the most startling and mystic moments in the New Testament. Just for the pure awesomeness of the visuals. I mean, in Matthew's account, it's not just Jesus' clothes that are made white, but his very face and his body shines with brightness of the, the light that he bears within him. If there was any doubt among the disciples that they were dealing with something special in Jesus, it is confirmed here. But, of course, this is the interesting thing. Jesus tells them not to tell anybody. Not to tell anybody about this mystical experience that they have, this amazing vision, of this voice from heaven that says, this is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. Why? Why? Well, I think it's because this vision, this mountain experience, doesn't make sense unless we also consider another mountain experience, not looking backwards toward Moses, but looking forwards towards Golgotha. Lent begins and ends with the experience of two mountains in a way. It's bookended. We have this mountain, which might be Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon, we don't know, doesn't say. But this mountain, where Jesus' glory is revealed, and the other mountain, where his weakness is revealed, Golgotha, the site of his crucifixion. Not much of a mountain, really, more of a hill, but there it is, elevated above the town in some ways, so that people can look up and see the consequences of not adhering to the local authorities, to the Roman rule, to speaking out. Those two experiences, they bookend our experiences as well. You see, for us, Jesus on the mountain transfigured is probably the Jesus that we want. He's the Jesus that we want. The Jesus who is crucified on Golgotha is not the Jesus that we want. That's the Jesus that we get. I believe that if we just focus on Jesus as the transfigured one, the one who lives on the mountain in that kind of glorious thing, if we make the mistake that the disciples make of trying to build a, a little house for him up there, then we make the mistake of putting Jesus up there and away from us. But if we really want to connect with the reality of God in Jesus, we have to deal with the reality of the crucifixion. And that God's glory is revealed there just as much as it's revealed in the glorious image on the mountain. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means, first of all, I think that we have to reject the notion that we can reduce Jesus to uh, a philosophical position or to something which is kind of uh, just very light and, and, you know, Jesus as a wisdom teacher, that kind of business. Because the cross defeats that kind of notion right away. Like if all we have is the transfiguration, we could imagine Jesus as this holy figure who lives up on a mountain that we go visit so that we can get life tips. 
But when we see Jesus crucified on the cross, we see something else indeed. We see one who identifies with our suffering. We see one who sacrifices for us. We see one who will uh, go to the very depths of despair and pain for us. And that's a very different image indeed. You see, any fool can come up with a philosophy to live by, but Jesus gives us one to die by. And we see that just as much in the cross and that hill as we do on that mountain with the glory. And what's offered there if we go into that reality, is a Jesus who can be with us or anyone, anywhere, anytime. It struck me recently on, on Facebook, somebody was commenting about how they really admired a particular philosophical, philosophical school. It was uh, Stoicism. Uh, he was talking about Stoicism and how awesome Stoicism is. And, and somebody commented, isn't that kind of a white man's religion? <laughs> um, I mean, Stoicism makes a lot of sense if you happen to be like Marcus Aurelius and you're rich and powerful and you can bend the world to your will. Uh, Stoicism makes a lot less sense if you're poor, uh, minority, uh, you're living in an oppressive system, uh, you know, it's not, not the religion that's going to work for you. It's always striking that if you go to communities with really no suffering, you go to the shanty shacks in, in Mexico City, as I did one time, for example, and what you see, the image of God and of holiness, is the crucifixion. Right? Not the resurrected Jesus or, or even that kind of, uh, you know, that, that kind of classic blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. No, no, none of those kinds of images. It's the crucified one because that's the one who speaks to their experience. That's the one who speaks truth to their life. So, friends, when we proclaim this Jesus, we proclaim him not only as the risen one full of light and love and all that, we also proclaim him as the crucified one. Because if he is not crucified and raised to the dead, then we are to be pitied as Christians to have followed him because he is not just another wisdom teacher. He is the one who brings light and life. So now I'm going to open this up as I normally do and see if anybody has any response.